Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us for our webinar today. Um, this is a new area for us to develop a consensus statement on stroke and pregnancy, and really want to acknowledge the huge efforts and work of our two leads on this, which is Dr. Rick Swartz and Dr. Nur Latani. Um, it's my pleasure today to um, thank you all for joining us and to introduce both of our speakers. So Dr. Swartz is a clinician scientist in the Department of Neurology um, Division, of Division of Neurology, Department of Medicine at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and University of Toronto. He is the, um, he directs the Sunnybrook Stroke Research Unit and he's also the medical director for the North and um, East GTA Stroke Program, which is one of the big programs up at Sunnybrook. So he's also um, a co-lead with Dr. Ledhani on the stroke and pregnancy um, clinic that they run at Sunnybrook. And um, he's also been one of the leads throughout the stroke and pregnancy consensus development. Um, so we thank you very much, Dr. Swartz, for joining us. Dr. Ledhani is a specialist in mater maternal fetal medicine at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and also co-leads the stroke and pregnancy clinic with Dr. Swartz. She is trained in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Toronto and maternal fetal medicine and also um, in public health from Harvard University. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Please put your questions, send your questions to us so that we can have a fulsome discussion after the um, webinar is completed. And we'll now turn it over to Dr. Swartz to begin our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay, um, and thank you for being here. Um, as uh, as was just mentioned, uh, it's our uh, pleasure and pr privilege to get to uh, present this work. Uh, on behalf of one another as co-leads of this process, but also on behalf of a large group of people who contributed uh, to this and additional uh, consensus documents, which we're going to be talking about shortly, and, and we will acknowledge those people as we go. Um, I'm just going to uh, highlight uh, disclosures, and, and uh, neither myself nor Dr. Ladani have conflicts of interest or disclos disclosures. Uh, and this is really that large group of people that I was referring to earlier. These are individuals, uh, stroke neurologists from across uh, Canada, as well as um, maternal fetal medicine specialists like Dr. Ladani, obstetricians, uh, um, internists with interest in uh, obstetrical medicine, and anesthetists with interest in obstet obstetrical management of, of uh, uh, of pain and, and uh, treatment uh, and, and the management in our in our stroke population and so uh, a large and, and diverse group of people uh, not just from across Canada but also from the US and internationally representing a broad range of inputs what we're going to cover in today's talk is really looking at the uh, some information on the incidence and overview and importance of stroke in pregnancy and then we will be highlighting uh, the work that has uh, that we've gone through in building a framework and consensus process and highlight some of the consensus statements that have emerged from this work. The first question is how common is stroke in pregnancy? And in high volume stroke centers, most stroke neurologists have encountered patients who either have a stroke during pregnancy or at least as commonly have had a stroke before as a sort of stroke in the young uh, setting and are now contemplating or actively pregnant. Um, in addition, most high volume, especially high risk obstetric centers, encounter stroke in pregnancy. Um, and so these are relatively rare uh, in the setting of a primary care practitioner's office. We'll not see a lot of these in their practice. But in these kinds of settings where obstetrical care or stroke care are provided uh, in high concentrations, will be seen uh, fairly frequently. And actually, stroke is one of the leading causes of maternal morbidity and mortality in developed nations. And it's actually the outcome, one of the main drivers of adverse outcomes from what are still the highest risk pregnancy complications, even in developed countries, of uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, things like preeclampsia and eclampsia. Um, the end organ damage, uh, one of the ones that is the most devastating is when the end organ is the brain, obviously. Uh, so how common is this? Well. Uh, we undertook a meta-analysis and a systematic review and meta-analysis to address this that just came out uh, this fall, uh, where we looked at the English language literature and tried to identify papers that, that studied multiple types of strokes, uh, because hemorrhagic stroke, venous sinus thrombosis, and ischemic stroke, the blood clot strokes, 
um, in pregnancy are roughly a third, a third, a third. And, and we wanted, that's one of the questions we wanted to say to, to, to address is whether that holds true when we look across studies. Because even the raw numbers, how often does this happen? Uh, there's fairly variable literature out there. So we were trying to uh, take a systematic approach to the literature and combine that literature to get the most robust estimate we can. We uh, undertook a specific, uh, rigorous, uh, systematic review approach, identified uh, titles and abstracts to screen, excluded papers that, for example, only included ischemic stroke or only included hemorrhagic stroke or were not in English language, uh, identified those that are the most relevant, and then ended up excluding a full 100 hundred of those uh, because many of them were review papers, for example, without primary data. Uh, some of them didn't provide enough raw data to calculate raw stroke rates. Some of them were individual sort of one-off or a small number of case presentations. So they couldn't, again, give us a rate. We couldn't get the denominator. Um, and so all the reasons for exclusion are listed there and ended up with uh, 11 studies from around the world uh, over about a uh, 15 year time frame, uh, sorry, 25 year time frame. Um, and uh, these include small numbers of events when they were taken at single centers, uh, when they're looking back over thousands of pregnancies and how many stroke events have they had. And they include very large numbers of events looking at a, an American national registry. Um, and, and so we have uh, different types of data sets that were uh, identified. And you can see there is a, a fair degree of variation, um, but overall this coalesced on a fairly consistent number, uh, which just happened to be a very round number. We didn't even have to round it off, which is convenient because it's easier to remember, roughly 30 per 100,000 pregnancies. Now there is a margin of error from 20 to 50. Um, per 100,000 patients. You can see that in the error bars here around this estimate. Um, if you look at the estimates of stroke in young adults, so in individuals aged 18 to 45, roughly the, um, the childbearing years, um, that's about 10 per 100,000. So it is still safe to say that stroke is not exceedingly common in pregnancy. Um, 999,970 per 100,000 pregnancies proceed uncomplicated by stroke, um, but there is a three times risk compared to the general population. So it's relatively uncommon, but pregnancy does increase the risk compared to the non-pregnant population of young adults. Um, why is that? Well, there's a number of etiologies that can increase the risk. Uh, so aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, uh, can become more vulnerable in pregnancy, um, both because of hormonal changes that can affect the blood vessels themselves and because of complications of pregnancy. So things like gestational hypertension, the HELP syndrome, which is hemolysis, elevated liver, low platelets um, that can predispose to bleeding, and the significant high blood pressure that can come from preeclampsia and eclampsia. Um, there's also volume of distribution changes. There's more uh, blood volume in pregnancy, at, especially in the third trimester and immediately uh, sort of peripartum. Um, there's an upregulation of clotting factors as a, woman, uh, as a woman's body prepares for labor and delivery. And it can also be sort of a stress test for underlying comorbidities. So if somebody already has diabetes or has a congenital cardiac issue or has sickle cell anemia or has problems with their platelets or has an autoimmune disease, Pregnancy uh, can be a stress test that can either unmask or destabilize these chronic conditions. Um, so there's a number of different reasons that pregnancy can actually increase the risk of stroke. And when we broke it down by stroke subtype, we can see that the bleeding strokes, the hemorrhagic strokes, accounted for about 12 per 100,000. The ischemic strokes were also about 12 per 100,000. And the ve cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, CVST, accounted for nine per 100,000. So in, in round numbers, we're looking at about a third, a third, a third. Uh, it's important to note that there's overlap. So venous sinus thrombosis can also result in bleeding. Um, uh, they call it a venous hemorrhage. But uh, notwithstanding the, those kinds of overlaps, roughly 10 per 100,000 of each of these, which adds up to our 30 number. Uh, and you can see the, those margins of error uh, 
um, between blood clot strokes, ischemic stroke, venous sinus thrombosis, and hemorrhagic stroke all overlap quite significantly and are right around that 10 per 100. these cases need to be individualized. Next slide, please. Um, and so we approached this by developing a consensus statement. Um, we wanted to distinguish between consensus statements from recommendations, and we know that guideline recommendations are intended to optimize patient care, and they are informed by a systematic review of evidence and an assessment of the benefits and harms of alternative care options. Whereas consensus statements, which was developed here, is a comprehensive analysis of the scientific or medical issues by a panel of experts. Um, and it used the evidence that was available. Um, and where the evidence was deficient, um, we approached clinicians and scientists for guidance on how to approach these. And so it's based on ex expert opinion. Um, and we use terms like should be considered and may be considered, understanding that each of these cases have individual um, issues that need to be taken into consideration. Um, so the way the consensus process was developed, um, I'll ask Dr. Schwartz to discuss. So this used uh, a sort of rigorous scientific approach to consensus development called Delphi consensus process. And this is um, something that those of you who have seen other uh, Canadian Stroke best practice recommendation sessions before, uh, this is the same methodol methodological approach. Uh, it starts with a systematic review of the literature and the evidence to date. And really we're borrowing, um, in this case, there's not as much directly applicable evidence uh, with randomized controlled trials of uh, pregnant women who have a stroke right then and there. Um, but there's a very large robust literature on uh, the management of stroke and there's a very large robust literature on uh, obstetrical issues and obstetrical management and then really we had to look at how those evidences influence one another uh, so we know that uh, there's good evidence to say that plavix may be um, a good antiplatelet agent clopidogrel excuse me uh, for secondary stroke prevention and in the obstetrics literature, we know that we just don't have enough evidence to know what clopidogrel does uh, to the developing fetus as far as risks go. So we put those together and say, well, okay, maybe we don't want to use clopidogrel in stroke prevention because we don't have enough data. So it's really about merging those areas of evidence uh, and taking the established evidence and what we know and don't know from each field and, and applying them to the specific case and the specific patient. And we searched both uh, randomized controlled trial data, uh, existing published and gray literature talks and abstracts and presentations, and built uh, rigorous evidence tables, and then went through a process of writing and refinement and, and really perusing those and challenging one another with experts in the field uh, to say, where can we all agree? What areas are controversial? And how do we manage that? What factors, when we don't know what the right answer is, what are the factors to consider that can help guide? Uh, to make this a more useful uh, process. And then uh, ultimately leading to uh, external reviews and uh, publication and dissemination, which this talk is a piece of. Um, in the overall framework, we really uh, identified two subgroups. Uh, the first group, I always say that as a stroke neurologist, I end up seeing uh, 
um, pregnant women who get neurology, whereas my colleague, Dr. Bui, who works with uh, women with epilepsy, she sees neurological patients who want to get pregnant. Uh, in this particular case, we kind of broke down the stroke and pregnancy umbrella the same way. We have uh, women with a history of stroke um, who either want to plan for a pregnancy or find out they're pregnant and, and show up to medical care and looked at how do we manage the secondary prevention issues in a woman with a history of, of stroke when she wants to or already is pregnant. And the second uh, area is the acute management. If a woman is pregnant and that pregnancy becomes complicated by a stroke, how do we manage uh, that either during the pregnancy or immediately postpartum? In both areas, we have a number of issues that have to be taken into account that can impact the decision making. For example, when are we seeing this woman in the, in the process of uh, the pregnancy? Are we seeing her before she's ever pregnant and she's thinking maybe in the next year to start trying versus it's now the second trimester and she's showing up in your office for the first time already on certain medications, but the first trimester, the highest risk time for some of the side effects from medications may already be over. Um, how severe was the stroke? Uh, what type of stroke was it before? Was it a bleeding stroke? Was it a venous sinus thrombosis? Was it an ischemic stroke? And what were the triggers or causes for that stroke? Um, so we have a number of factors to consider. How old is the woman? It may be that if she's currently pregnant and she's uh, 48, uh, the risks of being 48 uh, may be even more concerning than a stroke that might have happened when she was 20 from a traumatic dissection that never recurred and the trauma has resolved and so on. Um, similarly, in the acute setting, uh, the acute management, there are many different issues to consider if a woman is at term than if she's in her first trimester. Um, so the stage of pregnancy, the severity of the stroke. If this is a TIA or very minor stroke and she's high functioning um, versus if this is a severe disabling stroke with a large vessel proximal occlusion or basilar artery occlusion. Um, where we're seeing this woman, are we seeing her in an office setting? Are we seeing her in a setting uh, where we have access to multidisciplinary stroke care and obstetrics care, or whether we're in a rural setting and we, we don't have access to team care to the same degree? Uh, are there medical comorbidities? Is this a woman with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and lupus and other issues that have to be managed? So all of these different issues need to be considered and nuance the recommendation. So with those factors in mind, we really were trying to say, we need to combine for both scenarios, the prevention and the acute management, both the neurological and the obstetrical considerations. Um, the acute stroke uh, consensus statements are uh, still under development. And these are where we're gonna be looking at commenting on acute diagnostic imaging, MRI and CT scanning, for me, initial emergency room management uh, for things like TPA, antiplatelets, endovascular therapy, um, blood pressure therapy, et cetera, as well as obstetrical and anesthetic considerations in that setting. Um, we have to look at um, acute uh, and post-stroke obstetrical care. The full, this, this process, we've gone through the systematic review and the writing, um, the consensus process, and we're sort of in the process of the Delphi consensus where uh, those uh, statements are being reviewed now and iterated and getting ready for external review. So we're hoping that those are going to be uh, finalized and released uh, in, the, in the winter, in the coming uh, few weeks and months. Uh, in the meantime, the stroke prevention uh, topics uh, where we covered uh, general management considerations by term of pregnancy, as well as secondary stroke prevention topics like choice of antithrombotics, blood pressure management, statins and diabetes management, and covered specific common stroke etiologies. Uh, this is the one that has actually been released um, just uh, a couple of weeks ago now at the end of November in the International Journal of Stroke uh, with a consensus statement on secondary stroke prevention during pregnancy. Uh, for those of you who may be interested, I'll put in a, a, a little um, shameless plug for the best practice recommendations in general. Um, in the same issue of the International Journal of Stroke, um, the Canadian Stroke Best Practice recommendations for secondary stroke prevention in general have been updated and published in the same issue as our 
pregnancy specific secondary prevention module. Um, so there are the recommendations for all comers with stroke and how to manage them in secondary prevention and our uh, consensus statements on the management of women specifically uh, in pregnancy, uh, all in that uh, November issue. So those are two separate documents that are both uh, hopefully high yield for people on this call. And so as we were highlighting before, um, these are the areas of, uh, of prevention that we're going to be working our way through and we can share with you some of the highlights uh, from the document uh, that's been released. So um, one of the key interventions into secondary prevention of stroke and pregnancy is really pre and how to manage women who are on certain treatments is the concept of preconception counseling. And our recommendation was that in all female stroke survivors of reproductive age, preconception consultation can address risk factor assessment and pharmacologic management related to secondary stroke prevention in the context of pregnancy. So this includes counseling on a healthy diet, regular exercise, achievement of a healthy body weight, smoking cessation, alcohol use, and other lifestyle factors that can increase recurrent stroke risk during pregnancy, the modification of which could serve as secondary prevention, and then a review of current medications to evaluate for potential teratogenicity when um, using the available reference databases. Um, and so just like the example that Dr. Swartz used about clopidogrel, we aim to optimize women's treatment outside of pregnancy so that any drugs that are not recommended in pregnancy can be changed prior to the achievement of pregnancy. Um, this is an important time also for communication between health professionals with stroke expertise and those with obstetrical expertise. So it's a good time for a neurologist to get obstetricians involved and vice versa so that um, the pregnancy plan can be established prior to the establishment of pregnancy. The next slide. Um, and then it's the antenatal intrapartum risk factor screening um, was also discussed. So the initial obstetrical workup for pregnant women with a history of stroke um, and the recommendations were that we include for screening for assessment of vascular risk factors and counseling for healthy lifestyle behaviors, just as was mentioned in the preconception counseling. And then individualize a stroke prevention management plan based on each woman's medical history, their stage of pregnancy, the type and etiology of stroke, the stroke recurrence risk, and the personal goals and preferences of the patient and her family and care providers. Um, a collaborative plan should include considerations for labor and delivery. And this is sort of mentioned in this module, but it will be really discussed in a lot more detail in the acute module. In terms of um, postpartum stroke prevention, we know that stroke risk is the highest peripartum and in the first six weeks postpartum. And women need to be educated this time of the signs of stroke um, and the actions to call 911 for sudden onset of new neurological symptoms, severe headaches or changes in mental status or consciousness. So we recommend the teaching of the sort of fast um, module, which is thinking about the face, arm, speech, and time of the symptoms. Um, and those with high risk conditions or conditions requiring regular assessment should require closer monitoring. So women who are hypertensive should have weekly or every other week monitoring for their blood pressure control. They should be well versed into the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia so that the severity doesn't go to the time when the stroke is a risk. And then it should be a time where there's the facilitation of early involvement of stroke prevention specialists to reassess long-term stroke prevention management plan. So especially in a woman who had a stroke in pregnancy, the postpartum time is the time to establish a long-term um, lifelong care plan for her, as well as consideration of breastfeeding and or subsequent pregnancies. So, uh... The, in general, it is recognized that when we're approaching secondary stroke prevention, uh, the decisions in the setting of pregnancy can be very complex. Um, and as I had already highlighted earlier, the, it must be nuanced in the context of the stroke etiology, stroke recurrence risk, type of, pregnancy, uh, type of stroke, and stage of pregnancy. Um, specifically, um, we were also highlighting uh, prior medical and obstetrical history. This is especially relevant for things like anticoagulation um, because there may be a need to modify labor and delivery plans. Uh, a woman with multiple, multiple prior deliveries or a history of rapid or premature labor uh, could be at much higher risk uh, if they're on a low molecular weight heparin, for example, uh, whereby they could go into labor without sort of um, the opportunity to plan for and stop the low molecular weight heparins. Uh, so that may be 
uh, more proactive management may be needed in those settings than if she's a, a first pregnancy um, and uh, never gone through labor and delivery before. Specifically, when we're looking at antithrombotics, we divide that up into the antiplatelets and the anticoagulants. Um, so antiplatelets consist of clopidogrel, agronox, decagrelor, and aspirin. Um, if those are in use or indicated, usually for the ischemic stroke subtypes that we had been talking about, uh, the preference is to switch to aspirin, to low-dose aspirin, 81 milligrams once daily. Um, and ideally, if that can be done prior to pregnancy or pregnancy planning, um, at the very latest, done once a pregnancy is known or confirmed, uh, because we really just don't have safety data on clopidogrel, agonox, or ticagrelor, whereas we have uh, fairly extensive evidence, especially after 11 weeks, on aspirin. We really don't have evidence to support the safety of the antiplatelets other than aspirin. Um, beyond 11 weeks, the safety of aspirin is very well established. There is emerging clinical trial evidence and some large clinical trials uh, supporting the safety even of preconception aspirin up until 11 weeks. Uh, so in the setting of ischemic stroke with a reasonably high recurrence risk, uh, where antiplatelets may be indicated for chronic use, Similarly, in the setting of someone with cardiac disease for whom there's benefit from antiplatelets, uh, it's reasonable to be on aspirin even preconception and while trying to get pregnant, and women stay on that throughout the pregnancy then. Low-dose aspirin can also be considered during breastfeeding since there is some evidence that aspirin is excreted into breast milk in very, very small quantities, and uh, what, may, what little may be excreted into the breast milk is actually not absorbed by the baby's GI tract, uh, so there's extremely low to no exposure of the baby uh, to salicylates on low-dose aspirin. It is different at higher doses, but those doses aren't used or indicated for stroke prevention, um, so it's not really concerning. For anticoagulation, um, these are the stronger blood thinners than the antiplatelets. These include warfarin, these include the newer direct oral anticoagulants like the bigotran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban and include the heparins, uh, both intravenous heparin and low molecular weight heparin. It's important to note that warfarin is potentially uh, harmful to the baby if given, especially in the first six to 12 weeks, and is uh, really recommended to be avoided um, because of the potential teratogenicity. Um, if anticoagulation is needed um, before pregnancy or well, when, a, when a pregnancy is being planned, or uh, after pregnancy is discovered, a uh, recommendation to the injections with low molecular weight heparins is preferred um, and usually is maintained throughout pregnancy if anticoagulation is required. We really have no data on the safety of direct oral anticoagulants in pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy was a contraindication to their use in the clinical trials, uh, and we don't even have registries of people with accidental exposure um, and with the demographics of people that they're most commonly used in, uh, as treatments for atrial fibrillation, which is much more common in uh, people over 55, um, it's unlikely to get large numbers anytime soon. So again, the switching to low molecular weight heparin is the preferred approach. Um, in certain specific circumstances, therapeutic doses of low molecular weight heparin can be considered as an alternative to low dose aspirin, uh, especially if a woman is considered to be at high risk and then entering the late third trimester and six weeks postpartum phase. Um, and women with mechanical cardiac valves, women with known hypercoagulability, there is an indication for anticoagulation anyway. It has been well established um, in general terms, uh, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological uh, approaches to management of blood pressure are reviewed in detail with recommendations uh, from a pregnancy uh, consensus in the NICE guidelines, in the SOGC guidelines, the Canadian Hypertension Guidelines. So we encourage people who are interested in that to refer to, and, def and we defer to those uh, recommendations as well, but there are a few things we specifically wanted to highlight. Uh, the first is that there are two common classes of medications used often in stroke prevention. That's the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, so the angiotensin converting enzyme ACE inhibitors, and the angiotensin II receptor blockers, the ARBs. Um, these are both uh, have good level 1A evidence uh, for risk reduction in secondary prevention and stroke outside of pregnancy, but 
There's also a known increased risk of congenital abnormalities if taken during a pregnancy. So we recommend that these medications should be discontinued if a pregnancy is being planned uh, or discontinued as soon as it's identified in a woman who's been exposed to it and uh, that the baby should be uh, screened uh, with a detailed fetal structural ultrasound and counseling of the woman if there has been exposure. There are three drugs that we do commonly, most commonly use, which is labetalol, long-acting nifedipine, and methyl dopa, uh, where we have a uh, long-standing history of uh, safety, uh, safety data. Um, obviously, the blood pressure targets in pregnancy and post-stroke have to be nuanced based on the uh, stroke subtype and the risks. Um, we're balancing uh, the, the ideal of secondary stroke prevention um, with the ideals of maintaining adequate fetal perfusion. In general, the secondary prevention of stroke guidelines recommend maintaining a blood pressure of less than 140 over less than 90. And the current recommendations, although the Canadian guidelines are just being updated, so we are, we'll keep an eye on those, but uh, is uh, blood pressure and pregnancy targets uh, for moderate hypertension is less than 150 over less than 90. Generally speaking, we will pick the lower of the two um, as long as uh, severe hypotension or fetal perfusion are not threatened. And at a level of 140 over 90, uh, that's unlikely to be uh, an issue as well. Um, it's, it's important to, to note that statins, which are commonly used in secondary stroke prevention, um, are not uh, currently uh, recommended and our consensus statements highlighted that we really don't have enough evidence uh, of safety of statins yet. Um, given that the Sparkle study, which is the, big, the biggest randomized controlled trial uh, of statins and secondary stroke prevention, required 50 people to be on a statin for five years to prevent a stroke, um, an interruption of nine to 12 months is felt to be reasonable. Um, and uh, that we don't actually know what the right targets are within pregnancy. Uh, when we measure cholesterol levels and uh, trigl triglyceride levels in pregnancy, uh, they can be thrown off by the pregnancy and we don't have reliable targets or even reliable measurements. And so we don't recommend that the consensus statements were not to perform uh, fasting uh, cholesterol assessments during pregnancy. Uh, because it is difficult to understand what to do with that information. In general terms, though, we do want to encourage women uh, to pursue healthy diet, exercise, and non-pharmacological management of uh, cholesterol. There are some exceptions to, to this. For example, uh, some women with a history of familial hypertriglyceridemia may need to be, requi may be required to um, stay on a statin or to uh, consider other uh, approaches to bringing down cholesterol, usually that's done in consultation uh, with an endocrinologist or somebody with expertise in the management of these familial cases. In general terms, for the, the usual uh, indications for statins, uh, an interruption of statin for, for the purposes of pregnancy planning and during a pregnancy uh, are reasonable. Nora, do you want to speak to the diabetes management? Oh, sure. So um, pre-existing diabetes and gestational diabetes are, um, are uh, sort of issues that we addressed in the consensus statement. And it was just to say that um, women with a stroke and with diabetes who are pregnant require frequent monitoring throughout the pregnancy and, and postpartum. Um, generally, they're at higher risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, and so routine, and then the other statement is that routine screening tests, such as the glucose tolerance test, can, should be considered early in pregnancy to identify women at risk. And this is, again, just to um, identify who's at risk for a recurrent stroke in their pregnancy. Um, there are different SOGC guidelines and NICE guidelines on diabetes and pregnancies that we defer to. Um, women with diabetes in pregnancy have other vascular risk factors and other obstetrical risk factors, especially, like I said, the hypertension and the preeclampsia. Um, and women with diabetes outside of pregnancy, again, warrant long-term follow-up through their primary care providers with the goal to facilitate lifestyle interventions, like we talked about in the preconception counseling stage. Um, for women with gestational diabetes, um, there's 10-year risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which is elevated. Um, and so again, those women warrant 
different interventions for the secondary prevention of stroke. Um, and the guidelines can help sort of identify what the therapeutic targets are. Uh, there's, we also touched on specific stroke etiologies and their management considerations in the guideline. Um, Rick, do you want to? Sure. Uh, one of the areas to draw attention to uh, recently for anyone who has been keeping track of and is interested in those secondary uh, stroke, the general secondary stroke prevention recommendations that I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest areas of updates recently is the management of PFO, patent for amino valley, uh, the small hole, uh, as you see here in the top of the heart, there's a PFO here, and this can be a, a route in which clots that form in the veins can scoot over to the arterial side and be uh, shot up to the brain as a cause of stroke. Um, and uh, PFO is an area of controversy in the general secondary stroke prevention literature. Uh, there had been large clinical trials uh, uh, until recently that had failed to show benefit of closing uh, the hole in the heart, um, closing a PFO mechanically, so going in and putting a, a closure device here in this, into the septum. And uh, those trials had shown uh, no benefit in one-year outcomes, but more recently in the last year, uh, the five-year and longer-term data from several of these trials have begun to be released, and they begin to show longer-term accumulation of benefit uh, from the PFO closure. So there's a little bit of upfront risk as far as periprocedural complications, but long-term, the benefit actually outweighs that risk. And for select patients who have no other causes of stroke identified, um, PFO closure is now made it back into the recommendations uh, in, this, in this recent uh, version. I think importantly, in the setting of pregnancy, we don't recommend PFO closure to happen during the pregnancy. Um, there, that it is an interventional procedure. There's x-ray and uh, contrast dye exposure and uh, it is felt that the, given that the benefit is a long-term benefit, not a short-term benefit, uh, there is really no evidence of short-term stroke prevention benefit, that for the nine months or one year or less um, of the pregnancy and, and immediate postpartum period, that, we, that uh, our consensus recommendations say we do not currently recommend PFO closure in the setting of pregnancy. Um, Low-dose aspirin is, is a reasonable uh, uh, middle ground as far as secondary prevention goes in select cases, for example, if there's known uh, venous uh, clots, anticoagulation might be uh, considered. Other etiologies that we were discussed include um, cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis. Um, so this is a blood clot in the veins that drain blood uh, from the head. And as we mentioned, this is about a third of the causes of stroke in pregnancy. It can cause both bleeding and ischemic strokes. Uh, for acute cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis during a pregnancy, uh, we will often anticoagulate with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, and that's usually maintained throughout the, the remainder of pregnancy after, uh, after uh, venous sinus thrombosis and continued for at least six weeks postpartum um, or until such time as warfarin could be started uh, safely and feasibly. A woman uh, who had a long-standing history of remote, spontaneous cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis who's not currently anticoagulated, given the increased uh, thrombosis risk associated with third trimester and, and uh, post the immediate postpartum period, uh, it, the consensus was that it is reasonable to think about low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis in that time, um, especially during the six weeks postpartum period. Certainly not a universal recommendation, uh, but something that could be uh, discussed and considered. In uh, dissection or tears of the large vessels that uh, go to the brain, the arteries, there's four arteries that go up to the brain, the carotid arteries, the pulse we feel in our necks, and the vertebral arteries that run up the back. And any one of those can tear. Um, the inside skin of the vessel can tear off and clots can form that then fly up uh, and cause strokes. As you can see, a thrombus through the dissection either occluding the artery or in the image uh, on the right below, that clot kind of forming under the flap and then flying off and causing a, a problem up higher. Um, the, the, the best approach, the optimal approach to dissection is controversial even in routine secondary stroke prevention, and options include antiplatelets or antithrombotics. In pregnancy, generally speaking, 
uh, low dose aspirin would be considered in women who have a recent dissection. Um, it is important to, to note that monitoring only is a reasonable option, so no antiplatelets and no anticoagulants, especially if it was a remote dissection, for example, due to trauma that's now resolved. Um, but if there's a recent dissection, especially if symptomatic, um, and there's no clot hanging in the blood vessel that you can see, um, or somebody who had chronic dissection but with large residual scarring that could make the woman at higher risk for strokes, aspirin is a reasonable option. If they've had a stroke from the dissection and stop their aspirin now, restarting it in pregnancy may be something to consider. And in some specific cases, women with active dis symptomatic dissection um, who may have clot right uh, hanging in the artery, uh, interarterial thrombus, or in the high risk uh, period immediately peripartum, then anticoagulation may be something to consider in, in those select cases. There is no evidence that routine cesarean section is required or safer or preferred um, in dissection, and indeed in uh, even in venous sinus thrombosis. It may be a consideration, um, especially if there was a previous dissection during labor and delivery, um, but this is really where individualized decision-making between the neurology and obstetrics team is key. I always say uh, that I am the mummy doctor, whereas Dr. Ladani is the tummy doctor. Ultimately, she's the one that's uh, in charge of the labor and delivery uh, time phase. And uh, that's a decision that's made between the obstetrical team and the, and the woman, um, the mother, to decide where to, what is the best option, but it's certainly not a requirement from a stroke prevention perspective. We'll get into it more in the, um, in the acute module, but in any case where Valsalva needs to be avoided, such as something like this, we can avoid it without a C-section, but that will be discussed further in the acute module. Um, Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is a special case where women are at risk of clots and strokes, but also at high risk of, of adverse obstetrical outcomes, um, early preeclampsia, growth restriction, and stillbirth. And so these are women that we usually treat when they have the history of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome um, with low-dose aspirin and low molecular weight heparin. Um, and that's to avoid the both maternal complications and the obstetric complications. So that's a general overview of the uh, consensus statements. Um, again, they can be found in um, the November International um, Journal of Stroke um, and on the website. But generally, we approach this um, with the evidence, but also to look at addressing the emotional dilemmas that are involved in caring for two patients and mitigating the risk to both patients, understanding that really like we said, maternal health is vital for fetal well-being. And we approach this with a patient-centered team approach. We give consistent and clear information with um, a multidisciplinary approach between neurology um, and obstetrics and social work and pharmacy. And the whole team is really involved. We weigh multiple considerations, assess the risks, and involve all support systems necessary. We consider the effects of the disease and the treatment on the mother, the fetus. Um, we consider those when making uh, plans for labor and delivery and in breastfeeding. Um, just again, to review the overriding- We wanna recognize. The overriding principles in management. Maternal health is vital for fetal well-being. Um, think about how you would treat the stroke if the woman wasn't pregnant, and how would you manage the pregnancy if the woman hadn't had a stroke? We need a team approach, planning is important, and all of these cases need to be managed individually. Um, and that is it, so we have time for some questions. I'll pass it back to Elizabeth. Great, thanks very much, and thank you very much to both of you for a great presentation. I'm just gonna dive right into the questions. We have a few that have come in. Again, for anyone that has a question for Dr. Lanhani or Dr. Swartz, please submit them through the chat function or through the Q&A function on your GoToWebinar panel. Um, so how, uh, can you deliver CVST patients vaginally? So again, it's, um, it's sort of a, a, we approach it case by case. If there's no contraindication to a Valsalva, then we, then we don't change the management at all. If, the, if there is 
uh, reason why the woman can't push. We can bypass pushing using an operative vaginal delivery where we ensure that there's adequate analgesia. Um, we allow the, the fetal head to descend what we say passively through the contractions and then we assist in the delivery with a vacuum or forceps and it really bypasses any need for the mother to push um, and in cases that are extreme or if the patient preference is to avoid an operative vaginal delivery that's when a c-section is employed so in these cases we work with neurology to sort of determine what precautions need to be taken and how best to deliver both both patients health health issues. And when using LMWH, which blood tests are recommended at baseline and during follow-up? Um, so the nice thing about the low molecular weight heparins is we don't need too many uh, blood, uh, blood tests to monitor. So the intravenous heparin has to be monitored to make sure that it's at therapeutic levels, but not super therapeutic. The low molecular weight heparins, obviously we want to make sure that the woman is not at a uh, very high risk of bleeding beforehand. So a CBC, make sure the platelets are okay, make sure she's not anemic as a baseline. Um, and uh, But we don't need to be monitoring uh, INR or PTT um, throughout uh, the pregnancy. In most cases, when we put women on low molecular weight heparin as a prevention through the pregnancy, uh, we're not doing serial blood work. Uh, to monitor her status. Um, obviously, if she's getting fatigued um, at routine uh, visits, you know, if she has symptoms of anemia or symptoms of spotting or bleeding, then that has to be reevaluated. Uh, but if she is uh, stable or even just maybe has some incidental uh, superficial uh, bruising as a side effect, uh, we would just continue on. Um, nor is there any, I mean, obviously, we need to make sure renal function and liver function at baseline are. Uh, are reasonable, and that's about it. Yep, exactly. We only we only monitor when there's renal impairment, hepatic impairment. Um, is there a, is a history of migraine significant for stroke risk in pregnancy? That's a great question. Um, so migraine with aura is a risk factor for stroke uh, in general. Um, it's not a very strong risk factor, kind of like pregnancy, in that the, in absolute terms, most migraineurs don't uh, have strokes, but it is, it does increase the risk a few times compared to non-migraineurs, especially migraine with aura. Uh, in pregnancy, um, migraines can destabilize during pregnancy, uh, so we actually more often see stroke-like presentations uh, from things like unstable migraines, which are uh, like acephalgic migraines that develop, uh, which is you get the aura, but you don't get the headache. So a lot of times people have loss of vision and is this a TIA, is this a small stroke? And it, it more often than not is an acephalgic migraine. Um, but migraine with aura can be uh, a risk factor. It's not a large one uh, for stroke within pregnancy. I think many more women have um, headaches destabilized in pregnancy and have the atypical auras than have actual strokes. Uh, the literature on this in pregnancy specifically is scant. Okay, great, thanks. And last question, how do you balance wishes of the mother if they differ from the spouse or partner in decision-making? We, we, I mean, the, it's the mother's body, so she, she um, sort of, what she says goes, and obviously we involve social work and we have family meetings to try to come to a harmonious treatment plan, but at the end of the day, and it's unusual to have cases where the mother's wishes are very different from the family wishes, but at the end of the day, we respect that it's her body and any treatment decisions really need to be hers. I, th I think the one challenge that you run into, and I'll just prompt you with a follow-up question, is when the woman's incapable uh, or nearing incapacity, there are occasionally cases where the woman will say, no, no, don't worry about me, do what you need to do to save the baby. Um, and the spouse or family may be saying, well, we need you healthy too. And that's where that philosophy that you started with, that we need a healthy mother to get a healthy baby uh, comes into play. And so sometimes that can be, I guess, a bit of a challenge. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I mean, general, I mean, that 
it usually fits with our general principle that we do need to treat women and um, in cases where the woman's wishes can't be heard, we do defer to the family um, and to what she would have wanted um, prior to the event that, that has made her incapacitated. But I, I have to say, we, we don't run into this ethical dilemma, dilemma thankfully, very often. Hey, well, thank you very much to both of you for an excellent presentation. Um, like I mentioned, there will be a recording and an evaluation that is sent out uh, probably by tomorrow at the latest. And you, if you would please take part in that and provide your, your feedback and input. And the recording will also be available on the Stroke Best Practice website where the new guidelines are as well. So thank you very much for attending, everyone. And thanks again to our speakers. We hope you have a great day. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.